Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, I have Stephanie Rayberg Webster with me, um, and she wrote a book, uh, Preserving the Vanishing City, Urban Preservation and Amid the Urban Decline in Cleveland, Ohio. So Stephanie, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So uh, tell me um, about your background. Sure. So, um, well, I'm I'm currently an associate professor of urban affairs in the Maxine Goodman Levin School of Urban Affairs which is in the Levin College of Public Affairs and Education at Cleveland State. Um, I've been here about 13 years. Um, prior to this, I was a, a little bit nomadic. So I grew up in, in Cincinnati um, and have a bachelor's of urban planning from the University of Cincinnati, where I really kind of just fell in love with cities and particularly um, old cities and old neighborhoods and find these places endlessly interesting. Um, I lived in Chicago for about a year before pursuing a master's degree in historic preservation from the University of Maryland, and from there went on to earn a PhD in city and regional planning from the University of Pennsylvania, where I uh, really specialized in urban preservation uh, centered on kind of issues of community development, neighborhood development, and urban revitalization. Yeah. And when you um, said that, and this is probably jumping a little bit ahead in the podcast, yeah. but is there, do you see a big difference between like preservation in an urban setting and in a rural setting? You know, I think the issues are just different. Um, and of course, there are probably some similarities, right? There are some, um, uh, you know, some more rural and small town locations are certainly grappling with issues of kind of economic distress um, these days. But I think just kind of the larger issues of urban preservation, whether you're talking about gentrification and, and big population growth and development pressure or cities like Cleveland and Detroit, where the scale of loss is so much different than what has occurred in rural areas. So I think they're just um, they're just a little bit different. Um, and I'm just kind of a city person. So I tend to focus on the on some of the larger cities. Yeah. Okay, very good. So what what bre- what drew you into preservation? Sure. So I think there's kind of two two aspects of my background that, if I reflect on it at this point, really brought me here. One is that um, as a child, my dad taught uh, middle school social studies, geography, and Ohio history. I grew up in Cincinnati. Um, so, uh, and my parents were both teachers. So we we traveled a lot to all of these historic sites, right? Up, like up and down the Eastern Seaboard, all throughout the Midwest. When I was a child. I'm sure I complained about this endlessly when I was like 10 years old, um, but it was really fascinating. I think in the in retrospect, it really built this like appreciation for historic places. Um, and then after earning my uh, bachelor's degree in urban planning, I actually worked um, for a year uh, doing urban planning work, but it was largely for a firm that was doing kind of planning for the outlying suburbs, mm. kind of new areas. And I was like, this is not you know, this is not what brought me to to city planning. I really like cities and old parts of cities. So the young 20s version of me thought, I'll go get a degree in historic preservation, and then I will work in older parts of cities. Um, So I kind of fell into it in this kind of roundabout path. Um, But it's just captivated me ever since. Yeah. 
it's it's interesting talking to different people. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about about yeah. doing the podcast, talking to different people about how they get into preservation. And it's it's always, you know, it's it's never quite that's that's not a career path that most people right. think about initially. <laughs> right, right. We don't get a lot of college freshmen who are like historic preservation. Right. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so uh tell me about uh your book, Preserving the Vanishing City, Historic Preservation Amid Urban Decline in Cleveland, Ohio. Sure. So the book really chronicles the rise of um, institutionalized, I call it, historic preservation or the field of historic preservation within Cleveland. Um, the, the central focus is mostly on the 1970s, but there are, of course, precursor narratives, kind of how we got there from the from largely the 50s and 60s. And then some of the stories in the book are carried forward into the 1980s. And in fact, um, some of them kind of illustrating how slow preservation and change can happen in cities like Cleveland. You know, some of the stories are still not finished today right. in 2023. Um, so I approached the book largely because I came across an anecdote um, years ago. Books take a long time to write. So years ago, I came across this anecdote that Cleveland was the first city in the state of Ohio to uh, adopt or create a local preservation commission. It's known as the Cleveland Landmarks Commission. Um, and I live here in Cleveland now, and uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, and I kind of just found this anecdote curious and interesting, and I started digging. And before you knew it, I was fully immersed in a, a book project. And so the book really covers not only kind of the, the foundations of a preservation ethic in Cleveland, um, it, the, the creation of the public sector, Cleveland Landmarks Commission, the nonprofit Cleveland Restoration Society. Um, but it also dives into some specific case studies about projects or things that were happening in Cleveland in the 1970s. So everything from in, uh, dealing with the city's industrial heritage, mm -hmm. which is really fascinating um, uh, for a city you know, whose foundation is kind of based on heavy industry. You know, we're not just talking factories or warehouse buildings, but like heavy machinery and infrastructure and engineering landmarks. Um, I talk about adaptive reuse in a downtown, in our downtown warehouse district, where preservationists really had to, at that point, overcome uh, zoning laws and state building codes that effectively prohibited adaptive reuse. Oh, you know, and in and in overcoming those things, they've set the stage for like widespread mm -hmm. adaptive reuse in the contemporary period. Um, and then I talk a lot about neighborhoods and different contexts, everything from Cleveland's most um, kind of, if you will, prototypical gentrifying neighborhood, which in a city in decline looks a lot different than gentrifying neighborhoods in like New York or San Francisco. Um, to neighborhoods that in the 70s were experiencing really rapid racial change and the kind of difficulties that preservationists faced in um, kind of, I think, uh, I think it's okay to say failing to figure out how to navigate a, a really significant history maybe of a neighborhood yeah. um, where the residents were completely different in a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, so the book is really it kind of covers expansive topics in preservation centered on these stories in Cleveland and around the issue of the kind of entrenched and escalating decline that was happening in the 1970s. Yeah, that's um, I think that's all of those things are very important to to highlight, because I think now we just take it take for granted, you know, the ability to adaptively reuse a building. Um, but there had to be people that were going to figure out how how to do this. Right. Um, right. Because I think right. before the thought was just we're going to tear them down and start over, and um, and and probably build something better. <laughs> right, right, right. It was really uh, fascinating to learn like how I mean the de the detail can lead you into these rabbit holes of state yes. policy and legislation and state hearings and testimony. Um, but but sometimes it's important, I think, to dive into that to really understand how hard it was yeah. to figure this out. Yeah, yeah, that's something that I hadn't thought of because now I understand, you know, how how all that works together. But I hadn't thought about it from a from a past perspective. So I I think that 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 is great. Um, yeah, when you're, I think that the um the rapid 
uh, racial change is, you know, still happens within cities. You know, the emig- the immigrants in one neighborhood move out and then the new immigrants move in. Yeah. Um, and that um, I see that, you know, even in Lancaster, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a section of town that was li- the Germans lived in for mm-hmm. for generations. And it's called they call it Cabbage Hill because they all had cabbage. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and and now there's probably not very many German families living there. And um, I was on a, a call, a city planning, you know, like Zoom. It's been since COVID. Um, and there was somebody younger than me and I did, I did not feel like I was that old. And he was like, he was like, he was like, well, nobody knows why it's called cabbage. I was like, yes, you you people do. (laughs) Right. Right. That's, that's kind of, you know, and even I've lived in Cleveland 13 years. I did this research. So the neighborhood that is the, that in the book that I talk about in terms of racial change, we call it Buckeye. It's the Buckeye neighborhood. It's on the far East side of the city of Cleveland. And you know, it was once the largest Hungarian enclave in the United States. And I had no idea. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea. And, you know, at this point, it it basically um, went through racial change, sort of the one part of it in the 60s, one part of it in the 70s, by the mid 80s, it was, you know, that process was largely complete. And now there's one church remaining. Um, there were like 20 at one point in this one neighborhood. There's one church that still offers a mass in Hungarian you know, in the neighborhood, but there's all the businesses have left. So it was really sort of interesting to think about and to kind of think about preservationists in the 1970s dealing with this as it's happening, like in front of right in front of them. And how do you navigate? Um, So I I try not to be overly critical, right, because I try and think like this was all new. It was all brand new. And so they're navigating. Yeah. And when you're close to something, too, it's hard to it's hard to know what to, what to, what's important, what's going to be important in the future. Um, I, I um, am part-time executive director for our countywide preservation uh, group. And um, I have, we have like a countywide survey of historic resources. And my big complaint about it is, is that when they did it, the last countywide survey was done in the early nineties. And um, they, had a definite bias against early 20th century buildings Mm -hmm. like and so now it's really hard to go in and advocate for these buildings that are over 100 years old most of them when somebody's trying to pull a demolition permit because somebody you know 30 years ago decided they weren't important yeah but but that that perspective of time everything changes everything everything changes with time you know and i think i i totally agree when you're right in the middle of it you know um uh one of the things that had had never dawned on me um, when I when I was looking into the industrial heritage piece, I thought, you know, they they did all the, these documentation efforts, and there's not a lot about reuse. And I thought, well, of course, like it's a post-industrial city. You know, I live here now. I see all of this stuff and vacant vacant buildings and factories. And um, you know, it was even surprising to me. Yeah. that in the late 1970s, many of these places were still in use. Oh, yeah. Maybe not at like maximum production as they were in the early 20th mm-hmm. century, but, you know, some of the um, factories or industrial complexes that are really kind of challenging to the city now weren't totally vacated or abandoned by 1977. And so preservationists weren't thinking or weren't, couldn't right. anticipate like what was about to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that that's very very true. Um, one one thing that I I thought was um I really liked in in your book uh, was that you talked about use being key to mm-hmm. preservation. Uh, because I always say I say it differently, but it's the same thing. I say you know a building has to be useful in order for it to be preserved. Right. You know, it, yeah. Because because people will call me or you know reach out to me about like oh can you believe what they're doing i'm like well at least they're restoring it like right. everything <laughs> else that they everything else that they're right. doing we could we could we can navigate later yeah <laughs> but the building's right. not getting torn down <laughs> so right 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 i think that's like it's a really you know for us in in cities like um like cleveland uh, Detroit, Buffalo, you know, some of the the kind of post-industrial, like I, we, I call them legacy cities. I, I use that phrase. Um, you know, there's just, a, there's a lot of stuff because these cities were built, you know, Cleveland once had, um, uh, I forget the peak population, like, like 900,000 people, 
never hit a million, but now it's under 400,000. Right. And so like, that's a lot of, of, of houses, of buildings, of religious institutions, schools, libraries, like everything like, where there's, there's too much. And, and said, yeah, yeah. And it's really hard to kind of, you know, preservationists really are confronted with making some tough decisions about what they're going to kind of go to the map for and advocate for and, and what they're not. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are hard choices. Those are. Um, so tell me about, you know, any interesting or surprising stories you learned as you researched your book. And I know that we've talked a little bit about some of them, but, it, but I'm sure you have others. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot, there was a lot that came out that like, I just, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know about, and I hadn't thought about, we've talked about a few of those, um, kind of the barriers to adaptive reuse that were really, um, these entrenched, building code, state building code laws that had to be overcome. Um, um, I think, you know, in some ways, some of the more interesting stories might be kind of the more mundane, mm -hmm. like the everyday stories. So I, I have a whole chapter about neighborhoods that weren't necessarily gentrifying rapidly in the 70s. Some of them are now in the in the 21st century. Right. Um, but these were just kind of the everyday neighborhoods that were facing some population loss, not intensely rapid compared to other parts of the city, but, you know, um, uh, neighborhood business districts suffering because we were building suburban malls and shopping centers, like all the things we know about urban change that happened in the late 60s and into the 70s and 80s. Um, and that really kind of, you know, People from these neighborhoods organized. Um, Cleveland is known for its community development sector and how kind of ingrained, it, it's almost like an intuitiveness that makes preservation or the saving of the, the built infrastructure of these places central to their work. Like it wasn't like we're going to do preservation now and, or we're going to do community development right. now. It was just like, this business district is a key part of our neighborhood and we have to figure out how to save it. And sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't, Right. you know, um, but how kind of, in some sense, preservation was, was more, was institutionalized and there were these formal structures and they were starting to designate historic districts and do adaptive reuse. But there were also people across the city who were just trying to figure out how to save their neighborhoods, right. you know, and that, wasn't always incredibly formal. And so I talk about that and um, I have a whole chapter about housing rehabilitation. Um, that one reviewer, one um, as an aside, one reviewer uh, thought I shouldn't include, but I insisted on it. <laughs> so, um, because it wasn't, pres it's not about historic preservationists. It's about right. housing rehabbers who weren't yeah. following preservation rules. They were just, you know, but I think this is important for preservationists to grapple with that like, yeah sometimes saving just like the built fabric of a neighborhood um, maybe has a little bit different standard to it. If you right. want, you don't want to lose kind of the overall fabric, you, you might need some more moderate rehabilitation strategies. Right. right. And, and I think that sometimes we can, you know, save what, what is there without doing a complete complete restoration, complete, you know, Absolutely. just per, just doing preservation because preservation is just retaining what's existing. What's there. And I think that's really important, especially in places where you have things like a high poverty rate, mm -hmm. you know, where you're just trying to house people and you're trying to house people affordably. Right. You know, in Cleveland, I, I tend to say we don't really have a housing affordability problem widespread. We have a housing quality problem yeah. because of the level of disinvestment and the level of poverty. Yeah. And that's something that I think preservationists could stand to do a little more work on. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I agree. And I think that there, um, I, I did a podcast probably almost a year ago now uh, with a, a an organization that I think they're a nonprofit that their business model is going in and preserving older buildings than to make it affordable housing. Mm -hmm. They're using the preservation tax credits and yeah. the um, affordable housing tax credits yeah. together. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think that on a larger scale, I don't think that there's probably a ton of money to be made with that approach, but right. I think that it, I think that it's a viable approach for a small, on a smaller scale. I think on a yeah. smaller scale. And when you're talking about, um, like older apartment buildings mm -hmm. that are around cities. I think Cleveland has a vast landscape of single family and two family houses. And that's 
to me, it's like one of the most challenging. It, it, it's like the most every day, right? I, like yeah. people's houses. And for preservationists, it is the most challenging thing, yeah. you know, because like, unless some developer is going to buy 50 of them and package them as a tax credit deal, you can't do a one-off. Like they're right. very yeah. hard. Yeah. And, but that's the vast landscape of this city and there's not a lot of tools to help. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. I, um, I do, I do get, I, I, I get fired up driving around Lancaster seeing yeah. the, the flippers that put fake shutters on, but that, that's just, <laughs> that's just a Danielle thing. <laughs> <laughs> fake right, fake right, shutters right. and taking the plaster off walls to expose the brick. <laughs> right, right, right. I will say if I could share one other, you know, oh, sure. one other interesting, um, one of the interesting things I think that I found out is also it was in diving into this, finding out the people who were involved and kind of how they fit our stereotypes mm-hmm. about who does yeah. preservation and who doesn't. So um, it, you know, it was really interesting to, you know, there were some, Um, prominent local architects who got very involved in preservation, some um, more kind of wealthy female philanthropists, which has a long tradition. Actually, the namesake of my school, Maxine Goodman Levin, was one of the kind of early proponents. That was really interesting just because I, I, she's, um, uh, she passed away a a number of years ago, but it's kind of interesting to learn, right, about that and the namesake of our school. But um, also, some organizations like our Cleveland Restoration Society was had three co-founders, and one of them was a prominent um, African American woman here in Cleveland, which was pretty unusual right. um, for preservation in the 1970s. And so, I think um, at least acknowledging acknowledging those roots and those that there were that these were actual people who dedicated an enormous time amount of time and energy really out of just passion for the city, right? right? right. And yeah. and to kind of grapple with like how much these people really loved this city and were trying to uh to to sort of um push for some some what they viewed as positive change. And so that was really it was just a really you know kind of fun and interesting aspect of the yeah. project. Yeah. Yeah. I that 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 is that is, um that is I I I enjoy learning about the people who who came before too because they are not always the people that you would assume. Right, um, right, right. And kind of how they creatively came up with ideas. I call them entrepreneurial, right? Yeah. And I, I sort of wish preservation had more of that these days, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. I think once we kind of establish landmarks commissions or preservation commissions and, mm-hmm. you know, now they're in the day-to-day management of like certificate of appropriateness review and, and right. there's some new designations, but the level of kind of creativity and grants and projects and surveys and interesting stuff that they did because they were just establishing the profession, you know, locally at that time, you know, I kind of wish we had a little bit more time and energy for that these days. Yes. Yeah. I I agree. I think that um, sometimes the better solution could be found, you know, creativity, you know, you know, if you looked at something with creativity um, so yeah, I definitely agree with that. We, I think I mentioned before we started recording that Jonathan and I um, had gone to a, a lecture last week about um, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy and the DuPonts restoring the White House. Well, she didn't have any money to restore the White House, which is why she went to the DuPonts. Yeah. And she, but one of the things she did was start selling, um, start selling uh, White White House souvenir books that was actually the start of the White House Historical Foundation. And they sold them for a dollar a piece and she sold 600,000. And I said to Jonathan, I said, I said, that was so smart. I like, she didn't have any money. So she was going to figure out how to raise it. I said, how do you do this? Right. Yeah, you just yeah. figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. But, but yeah, those kind of stories always like give me inspiration to, to try yeah. to find solutions. Right. Right. I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. A dollar a piece would be pretty hard. <laughs> Right, right. Just yeah. the production cost these days, right? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. When they were talking about how much she spent just in the, like, she spent all of her money in the private area of the White House, getting, like, upgrading it for, for okay. them to live in. And it was like, I don't know, $50,000. I'm thinking in the early 60s, that was a ton of money. Like, not that it's not a lot now, but I, did, I didn't run it through the inflation calculator, but I can't imagine. No, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so tell me about the challenges um, of historic preservation among urban decline. Um, sure. So I think, you know, 
the, the kind of simplest way I phrase this, which is like, um, makes me sound very non-academic, right? Is that we, I, what I said before, we have too much stuff. Yeah, There's just too much stuff. And so I think the challenge is um, figuring out what, um, like what you want to prioritize, right? From a preservation standpoint, you know, I think in the 1970s in this, what I cover in this book, there's some strategic thinking about what they wanted to prioritize. And there's some opportunistic thinking, right? Which is an opportunity arises and you pursue it. And that still happens today. Um, but, I, you know, I think that's the challenge, right? Like every time, if you're in a city with no population growth, and in fact, um, in the 20. 20 census, Cleveland lost more population. So the, the rate of decline has slowed, um, but it hasn't even begun to reverse. Now, right. some neighborhoods are doing very well. Downtown is doing very well. So it's not a universal, right, across the city. Every city has these pockets in different areas. Um, but, you know, in some neighborhoods you hear, oh, they're going to, you know, rehab this vacant historic school and turn it into housing. Well, in a city with no population growth, does that just mean something else, some house or some other thing is like going to be vacant? Like, right. how do you, or is this representing like an increase and in are people choosing to move back to the city or new people coming in? Um, so there's a lot of tough choices. You know, we have a lot of really beautiful um, and really historic, you know, schools and religious institutions and neighborhood business districts and and then this vast swath of, of the residential landscape from single family to two family to apartment buildings all over the city. And a lot of demolition has already occurred. And so one of the, um, uh, so I think that's challenging, right? Because you have streets that in, in reality, they're kind of everyday older historic housing maybe, but the fabric is just yeah. kind of gone at that point. There's been so much demolition from the 1960s to the present day. You know, one of the things I learned was that Cleveland um, in the 60s, in the 1960s was the first city to receive federal funding for demolition, wow. not tied to urban renewal. Not tied to urban renewal. Not tied to urban renewal, right? So we think of demolition in the 60s as urban renewal, right. um, but Cleveland received money beginning in the 1960s. And of course that has continued off and on. It escalated around 2008, huge amounts of money came to the state, states like Ohio and Michigan, really funneled to urban areas for demolition. Um, was that, so to, I, was that, to, was the thought to counteract blight? I know I'm, I'm just it is to, Yeah, it is to counteract blight. And the, the 2008 kind of, it was the hardest hit funds that was in response to the foreclosure crisis, right. which hit these cities very hard. You know, so you have this landscape that's like not totally intact anymore. You still have population decline. And I don't necessarily, you know, I haven't thought through like what what structural changes could occur to preservation. But there are some structures like, you know, National Register listing and designation that get kind of um, voided when you have a, a landscape that's so altered from demolition over time or a city right. such in poverty that. Um, you know, there's one neighborhood where something like 90% of the houses are covered in vinyl siding. Mm -hmm. And that's a maintenance issue. And that responds to socioeconomic conditions, you know, yeah. but it's ineligible. So I think there are there are challenges in dealing with the, uh, the kind of structures of preservation that we have in place. And then there are just these practical issues of mm -hmm. like, too much stuff, right? <laughs> too much yeah. stuff. Well, and and, and that's, I mean, yeah, if you don't have, it's it's going back to the, the usefulness. Like if you don't right. have people to inhabit these buildings. Right. You know, what, what yeah. it, it hurts my heart to say, why keep them then? You know, like what, right. what, what are they going to do? What do you, oh, what do you yeah. do with all of it? Um, and at the same time, I think if you had really long-term thinking, um, and I am by no means an expert in, in things like climate change, but there are indicators that like the Midwest may experience a population resurgence right. um, due to things like internal climate migration. And so then there are these open questions of like, maybe the future will be different, right? Or, right. Yeah. Um, um, and what can we do? Um, so I think that's challenging. The other thing that I've thought about, and I mention it in the conclusion of the book, um, is that, you know, there are parts of, of Cleveland where there are neighborhoods in Cleveland, for instance, where population peaked in the 1920s mm. and demolition began in the 1960s, not tied to urban renewal. Okay. So from a really kind of 
um, pure preservation perspective and thinking about historical significance, you know, I don't think we've really begun to grapple with the the historical significance of the manifestation of decline on the built environment. Right. Right. And so for, and I'm not saying we need to like preserve vacant land, right. I haven't quite gotten to the point of thinking like, what would this look like, but some recognition Mm -hmm. because it is really historically significant for cities like this, what decline has done to the built environment. And Mm -hmm. to think about that from a historic preservation standpoint, um, it's a little bit mind bending, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. But, and when you said that, the first thing that went through my mind was like, is it part of the life cycle of a city? Mm-hmm. Like, is this, is this just the, the rhythm that cities go through? You know, there's, 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 right. you know, increase in population decrease and it just kind of ebbs and flows. But yeah, it is, it, there are, I mean, to tell the story of the, you know, the Rust Belt, the industrialization that these were booming towns and then that decline and the, and the, um, and what, what came along with that, that is an important historical. It's an important uh, historical story. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure what that looks like from like yeah. a, a preservation of a physical kind of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Standpoint. It would be really easy to tell like, on storyboards, but yeah, from a, from a built environment, that's, that's a challenge, but I think it's interesting. I do. Yeah. I think it's an interesting challenge. Yeah. 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 So, oh goodness, that gives me something to think about. <laughs> um, I think you kind of, we kind of talked about this, but ways to counteract, you know, you talked about prioritizing and, and things like that. So is there, as we kind of wrap up, is there anything that you wanted to share that you thought about when we were talking that I didn't think to ask you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think that the main thing is just, um, you know, I'm I'm really passionate about this book. It was it was a, a project I worked on for five years, including through the pandemic, which was challenging. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to put out in the world stories from places like Cleveland that are about historic preservation. There's not a lot out there, to be honest, about historic preservation. Um uh aside from kind of anecdotal or news stories in places like Detroit and Cleveland places that are really kind of still struggling um, and are not in the same really kind of growth and um, high development pressure mindset. So I hope that it kind of provides some nuance and different narratives mm-hmm. to the to the world of preservation than those that are kind of traditionally out there. Right. Yeah, I, I think I think that it does. I, I did enjoy I did enjoy reading it. So oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, where now that now that you've mentioned it, where can where can our listeners purchase your book? <laughs> um, so it's available. Uh, it's available right now for pre-order um, and you can pre-order it through. I'm looking uh, really quickly. So you can order it online through uh, Temple University Press, which is tupress.temple.edu. It's also available on major online retailers um, and other places. And um, I think if I can, I could give uh, listeners my uh, contact information. Oh, sure. Yep, definitely. Um, that was my next question. So pre- pre-order information and um, discount codes, that kind of thing from the from Temple University Press. And I believe it will be fully available on April 14th, 13 okay. or 14th. I okay. keep getting confused on the date, which I shouldn't, but sometime around there. That sounds like something I would do. (laughs) (laughs) And then I would just keep telling everybody the wrong day. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then how, how can, how can our uh, listeners contact you? Oh, sure. So the the best way to contact me is just through email, uh, which you can find me online, but it's s.ryberg, R-Y-B-E-R-G at csuohio.edu. Okay. Um, that's probably the best way. And if anyone has questions about the book or wants more information or uh, information on how to order it, I'm, I'm happy to happy to help anyone out. Okay, very good. And all on our on our website where I the podcast go, I will make sure that um, I will make sure that the um, your contact information and also the links to where to to purchase oh, are, are there so that if somebody's driving or something and they they need to go um, come back um or you know to to look for it because they didn't write yeah. it down um so well thank you so much for for your time today i i appreciated it i i feel like i have um uh learned uh more about about cleveland i was invited to a marketing seminar there 
several years ago and I didn't I yeah. didn't get a chance to go, but it's really not that far away. So I should I should yeah, make a trip. To come visit sometime. Yes. yes. Let me know. Let me know and I'll show you around. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you for having me, Danielle. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Practical Preservation Podcast. The resources discussed during this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.